All right, here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk today. Uh, once again, I'll be celebrating some new music. It is New Music Monday with a fantastic band on today, or one human from the band, Mr. Matt Burr of the Black Delta Movement. How are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you? I'm great, man. Where are you at? In your studio? Yeah, just in my studio in Hull, England, Yorkshire. So, uh, yeah, it's I'm just getting ready for the launch gigs. We've got the launch shows for the album this week. So, getting everything ready. I got to tell you, man, it's like May 1st and we're early in the year, but you may have made my favorite record of the year. Oh, no way. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's really wild because somebody sent it over to me and I think you heard I was uh, promoting it on the podcast a couple of weeks ago where they said, yeah. hey, kind of like Brian Jones Town Massacre. I think you'll dig it. And uh, I put it on. Usually when somebody says that somebody sounds like somebody, it's going to be a bummer, you know? Yeah, yeah, completely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when it comes to like desert rock, when people send over like desert rock. I'm like, dude, oh, I, yeah. I already got Caius. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. man. But I put it on and it absolutely blew my mind. And of course... Uh, it got me digging down the rabbit hole. And I would say that your uh, debut record for 2018 would have kind of a, a Brian Jonestown flavor and a kind of a Brit rock vibe. But this has, especially the uh, first track on the record, uh, for, what is it? Fourth, uh, fourth, fourth Path fourth of the Graveyard. Yeah, man. That actually, to me, had some flavors of like soul coffin back in the day. Yeah, well, it, it, the producer Malcolm Carter is—I don't know how familiar you are with him, but he's—he's he's a genius. Uh, there's no two ways about it, and he'll probably hate me saying that in public. But um, it, there's just this real magic way it works because the album really, when I demoed it up and everything, it was very shoegazy and very psych it was like kind of really is is as close to middle of the road psych as uh as you could really say but malcolm comes in and we play through it and um then after the first take he goes eh, what's what's fucking wrong with it so he goes just try this and i've got a 1967 box ultrasonic and it's got a built-in fuzz on it and it's the Best fuzz I've ever heard. And I got it because of the Brian Jones massacre. And he said, get that fuzz on and just do it. And I kind of did it. And for a while, because I've been so used to the song for four years, um, it just didn't sound right to me. But he said, no, 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 keep going with it. And he kind of got us all playing. And um, it just turned the, the groove of the song on its head. And there was one bit when we were doing the solo at the end, and we all started kind of wigging out a little bit. And um, he comes in after we finished the take. He was like, it was good, but you all got a bit too flowery and spoiled it. <laughs> so we, we we just kind of, he said, just settle back into it. Just the work and we can layer whatever we want onto it. And he just he just added so many different kind of feels into it that I've I've never even considered before. It's it's really wild because the record kind of dances around between kind of some upbeat kind of 60s psychedelia and then what I would call some straight up just David Lynch rock, you know? And, yeah, yeah. And, and this is kind of the second um, slight comparison that I've had in a few weeks. I had spotlights on a couple of weeks ago, but mm. there is some uh, kind of, uh, swans vibe in it like hiding in the tall grass you know some real dark cool shit yeah well that that one every song I suppose you always have a bit of a uh, vision for it and f tall grass really it, it nearly didn't go on the album but when I wrote it I wanted it to be a really dark and like horrible song um because there's elements of the album which are quite dark you know like like fourth pass and uh, zip tie, yeah, photograph, yeah, because that's that's quite a um, retrospective song as well. But then with um, 
with having the tall grass, I just wanted it to be really dark. And I've I've got just over there, I've got an electric tampura, which is basically like Indian uh, sitar drones. And I said to Malcolm, I really want to use this on something. He said, put it through a wire, wire pedal, man. And we got it through the wire pedal and a load of reverb. And it just got that really kind of, wow, wow. And it, yeah, it, it's, it was a real nice kind of groundwork to twinkle everything else up kind of thing. This record is, I mean, I can't even tell you how much I've been playing it. And one of the hats off to you is uh, something that me and my buddy Joey talk about a lot of bands that just put way too many songs on a fucking record. And, yeah. you know, it's all yeah. fur and and stuff that you're not even going to care about in a couple of weeks. But you went with eight tracks and... And some people's minds back in, like maybe right now would think, is this an EP? But in the 70s and the 60s, records were six, seven, eight songs. Yeah, it will. I, I think part of the problem we had, because we actually recorded um, 11 songs, in, well, 12, but one of them got scrapped in the recording progress, but uh, process. But one of the big things that kind of kept us to that as well, that we um, obviously you're restricted to how much can go on a vinyl. And you can squeeze bits on and, and, you know, sacrifice some of the quality and everything. But we just thought, I mean, from my point of view, it's taken me five years to release this album. So I just wanted it to slap as much as possible rather than just fill it out with, you know, with something that maybe doesn't quite fit the vibe of the album. Um, and I quite like, if you keep an album brief, people don't get bored of it so quickly. Like, I wanted people to hear all the album. Exactly. Exactly. That's a lot like in comedy right now. You know, people, it's like, oh, you shoot the hour. And now, you know, in a TikTok and an Instagram world, uh, people just, they just don't have the time and the, the ADD is just at the maximum right now. And yeah, you know, man. you're right, man. People might not ever even get to the back. And also in this weird world of where the bands are releasing one, two, three, four, five singles before the record comes out. And then by the time it comes out, people have moved on. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the other thing is like uh, the label first club said to do three singles, which I thought was a quite a good number for it. Really. Um, initially we were going to self release it before first club said they were interested. And we'd initially said four singles, but it's like, that's half the fucking album. It's, it's pointless. And you know, I, I want, I want people, I, I buy albums and I listen to albums as a full thing. So I want to put that out for people who listen to that as well. But, you know, they, not to sound like a an old get, but it, it seems like kids now, they don't listen to albums. You know, the, the, the art of the albums kind of disappeared a little bit. And I really want to really focus on that. I think if I'd have had more time and, and money, I, I'd have liked to have done B-sides for each single as well. Because the art of the B side's gone as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's kind of gone back to that fifties of like Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and you know, uh, Motown era, where you just released a few singles and then you just sent a bunch of guys on tour, which was bizarre, you know. Yeah, completely. It's it, the music industry is in a really weird position at the minute, and it'll be the, I, it's obviously the same for you with comedy as well. It, people have such short attention spans. You don't. It seems like people don't fall in love with a band so much anymore. Like, I think when I was at school and there was like the Strokes coming out and Arctic Monkeys and like me as like a, however old I was, 14 year old, it was like, shit, these are my people. And you fell in love with them and you dressed like them and you listened to everything that sounded like them. But now you just seem to find that people don't really do that anymore like it's really hard to find the scene and to really kind of want to learn everything about a band yeah you know it's really sad it's uh and the theme of this uh podcast i think over the last couple of years with comedians and bands has been algorithm and that yeah. nightmare of like how can you get into the algorithm well if you do get into it and it skyrockets you to like two three five million views what next? The people move on. It's really yeah. slow brewing. And as much as it, it might seem like it takes a long time and you're not getting anywhere, 
you really on the long end end up with some really great fans, or I would call them friends that are well invested into what you're doing. And, you know, that old thing, if you can have a thousand true fans, you can have a career in art, which is so true. Yeah, totally, man. Exactly that. And um, like that's one thing I've, I've been lucky enough to find over the years with the band. Cause we've been a band for 13 years now. And throughout the way, it's always kind of trickled up and got a little bit bigger each time. But there's certain people who have just supported us no end. They've never even questioned any of this. They're so supportive of it. And um, they're the ones who are really important. And I'd rather have those people where, you know, they care and they appreciate it. And I, I want to please them. You, as a performer, you want to pre please your audience and your fans, don't you? And I'd rather, I'd rather bubble over and just be able to keep doing it for 15 years than be, you know, like um, Imu did that someone I used to know. Like, Fair Plays makes a lot of money off royalties, but it's one song. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, and I, like I always say, my Patreon, the people on my Patreon, they're the gods to me because they truly yes. uh, were there during the COVID when I had nothing, and they're still there. And a lot of them had nothing at the time also. This is not people sitting around rich during COVID other than, you know, industries and uh, and uh, yeah. pharmaceuticals. But yeah, you know, that's it. <laughs> it's, uh, it means the, the world to me. And I, and I, you know, when I hear a record like what you've put out here, and I want to tell everybody what it's called because I want you to immediately listen to this record, Recovery Effects. And the band is the Black Delta Movement. Uh, they have a record out in 2018 called Preservation. Uh, when I hear a record like this, I immediately, I, I tell everyone. And, and, and over and over, I've said it on this show, the power of grassroots will smoke an algorithm anytime at the end of the day big time 100 percent. it's it's um an algorithm's only online but you know if people are sitting around and you know putting songs on at a club night or they're going to the gigs and everything that algorithm means dick all when you've got you know 100 people in a small bar or something um yeah it we, we i think everyone's so terrified of the algorithm but i think if we just go out there and just do it yeah um that's how you do it. You, you've just got to work, haven't you? And you can't always kind of blame technology because techno technology is changing all the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's <laughs> let's get into how you guys started. And you talked about The Strokes, which is one of my favorite bands absolutely of all time and also anything Julian's done, uh, including The Voids and yeah. stuff. But that was an amazing era we were going through, we had this big boom in the 80s of all types of different music, of course, from Jane's Addiction to Guns N' Roses. And, and then it kind of mm -hmm. uh, switches into this kind of cool melting pot of anything from, uh, uh, you know, gangster rap to singer songwriter Wallflowers to, uh, you know, grunge. And then yeah. there was this long period of music was happening, but then... A little thing called the Strokes, the Yeah Yeah Yeahs, Interpol. This comes around. The leather jackets come out. The guitars are on, and it feels dangerous again. And it was some of the best music I had heard in years, and a movement of where people were dressing rock and going out, and they were way into it. So, you being fourteen years old, were you listening to? What were you listening to? And then that scene hits you. Well, I, I was really lucky that my dad raised me in a really good way musically. So I grew up with like the Beatles, the Jam, Oasis, Blair. And like my first ever gig was Ocean Colour Scene at Hull City Hall when I was eight years old. And then it was Oasis when I was nine. Wow. So, I mean, I've, I've done well. I've been lucky. Um, and... I always kind of grew up listening to whatever my dad played me because luckily he's, he's got good taste, which makes birthdays really easily because that's easy as well because I can just get him a record I want. Um, but then then all of that hit in, in the early noughties and I I remember there was, um, there was a show on over here called The Hits 
and uh, and then there was um, on E4, I can't remember what the name of it was, Freshly Squeezed. And my dad shouts me through and he goes, Matt, come here. And there's Arctic Monkeys, I bet you look at the, on the dance floor. And he goes, these are going to be massive. And literally, two weeks later, poor, just blew up. And it was like, although me and my dad always still liked all the same stuff, that felt like my era. Um, and, you know, you had like Arctic Monkeys, you had Block Party, and yeah, you had the Strokes and everything. Uh, I was a late coming to the Strokes early, and I've still not seen them, but I do want to see them in, in London in August. But then I also found that there was like, obviously the Hives from Sweden oh. and the Vines. I mean, the Hives are true, probably the last truly great rock and roll band, aren't they? They're incredible. Like, what they do is so unique and ballsy. Also, um, Franz Ferdinand. Man, yeah, I adored that band. I listened to them nonstop. And um, then there was another one that I really fell in love with because I had a hard time at school. I, I got quite badly bullied and music was like my haven, really. And I found a band called Mando Diao and they were supporting Dirty Pretty Things who was Carl Bratz, um band after the Liverpools. And they were just, they felt like my secret band. Like in Europe, they were like Oasis, but in the UK, nobody had heard of them. And like their first three albums were as good indie as it gets. They were so good. And I kind of based a lot of in my first band, I, I wanted to be Mando Dio. And um that was very much kind of like my awakening as a teenager. And um and then my my first band split up when I, I think I was about 17 or 18. And um but I remember I went to the Black Keys at Manchester Academy. And my dad took me out of school early. He said I had a doctor's appointment. And the Black Angels were supporting. And I remember they came on stage and thinking back, they opened with Empire and everything changed. I just thought, shit, this is it. Oh, what a band. That song, Currency, is one of the best songs I've man. ever heard. Yeah, man. They just they get it so right with like heavy, but the space, and then you've got all the all the texture with it as well. And I mean, I, I remember I met Christian Bland, uh, Christian Bland after one of their shows years ago. And I, I was only about like, again, probably 19, 20 or something. And I go, what pedals do you use? And he goes, anything Sid Barrett uses, man. Yeah. I was like, fair play, man. Why, why keep it a secret? They, you know, people like Sid Barrett and Rocky Erickson are the greatest ever. So why wouldn't you want to use what they use? Yeah. And, um, I, I really think the, the Black Angels are, are probably the finest psychedelic rock and roll band in the world right now. That band they, is fantastic, man. I've seen them live twice. I have all their records. They are next fucking level, man. Yeah, man. They, they're just, I mean, it's a bit of a rite of passage. So the, the Black Dot movement has had a few members, but the fellas that are in now is Matty, Liam, and Sam. And, um, I said to them, look, if you're going to stay in this band, you've got to come see this band with me. So we um, we got tickets to see them in Manchester last month, two months ago. And they're just, they're just fucking great, man. They're, they're so good. Uh, and like I say, I don't think there's any band that does what they do as well as they do. Yeah. Yeah, and then of course, you know, Brian Jonestown Massacre is just the absolute high watermark legends of yeah. that that sound and you know, I don't know, 20 fucking records or what it's just unbelievable the output and the incredibleness of of that band and that sound, you know. I mean, here we're talking about they did that documentary years ago and and just, yeah. And they're bigger than ever now. Like their last tour, they were doing theaters and shit, you know? Yeah, man. And and about time as well. Like Anton, I've been lucky enough to meet Anton a few times. And he's he's the sweetest man, but I just feel so sad for him that Andy Timona painted him as this prick in, in the film. And you could not meet a more lovely guy. He's just really straight with with people. And, you know, everyone had arguments, but she she made a point of showing them up. But, you know, what do you think of his output over the years? I, I don't think he's ever made a bad album. And I'm not just saying that as a fan or trying to blow smoke up his ass. He, he genuinely hasn't put out a bad album, has he? 
No, no, it's wild too, because like he's so deep, deep into his career and, and it's always just primo. And you can tell he just absolutely puts his heart and soul into all of it. You know, there's no part-time Anton, you know? <laughs> no, not at all. And I, it, it made me feel a lot better with things as well, because you think like the Jonestown maybe didn't get like the success they deserved until Anton was mid thirties. And like, I remember starting out in music and thinking, right, I've got to be massive by the time I'm 25 or it's over and I'm working checkouts and delivery drivers or whatever. And then you see people like Anton and like Black Rubber Motorcycle Club and the Black Angels and whatever, who have hit their creative peak in the mid thirties to mid thirties or whatever. Yeah. And it just shows that music doesn't have to be a young man's game. You know, if, if you carry on learning and pushing what you do, and again, Anton's got his studio, and this is part of the inspiration why I did all this. Is he just gets in his studio, works for twelve hours a day, and smashes songs out? Unfortunately, I'm not as prolific as he is. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that because you're been a band what thirteen years, and you put a record out in two thousand eighteen, and then of course you know COVID happens. I understand that, but. Mm -hmm. Why did it take five years to put out this uh, new record? Um, well, so there's there's a few things really. So we we were going to when we did preservation, we were originally only going to do a single of King Mosquito, but we actually cancelled the studio time last minute because the drummer was away or something. And and in the end, I said, right, we, we've got to do an album now, otherwise the band's gonna die. We can't just keep doing singles and EPs and. So we did the album and everything, and then it, we recorded it in August 2017. And then Christmas 2017, three members of the band left and just weren't enjoying playing music anymore. And, you know, I think maybe I'm maybe I'm an arsehole to work with. <laughs> but um, it was probably that. So, but then we we saw the album and I thought, right, once it's going to smash out the new album and crack on. And then it got, then it became 2019. And we toured it to death and then the lineup changed again and I thought I need a few months off and then I'll write it, we'll record it in 2020 and we'll put it out and fine. And then um, I wrote most of the album before before the pandemic kicked off and we had it lined up to record it. So again, on, on the album, we were lucky enough to have uh, Barry Cadogan on guitar who in my opinion, and not just because he's a, a good friend, but he, he is absolutely the best guitarist in the world right now. Um, he's been my hero since I was like, 16. So he came, he agreed to come play on the album with me. And then there's Lewis Watt, and who plays bass with, with Barry in Little Barry, and Tony Coote, um, who also plays with Little Barry, and he also plays with P.P. Arnold. So we got it all lined up to go record the album with them, and, and we're sending the demos out, and they're all keen. And then somebody ate a bat and then the pandemic kicks off so i'm kind of sat there thinking ah oh, well because I, I don't know how it was in the states for you but in the uk all the time it's like in three weeks time we'll reevaluate if we can reopen in three weeks time so you're thinking hey cool three weeks time we'll go record an album then we'll go get famous and then mm -hmm. um, three weeks turned into three months and in that time, luckily, I, I I kind of wrote some of my favorite songs on the album, like "No Road to Go" and "Always Home," and um, yeah, uh, and then where where Malcolm Studio is in London, it's a, un, beneath a community center, and it was actually being used to house homeless people through the pandemic, so we couldn't go in and record. So it ended up being May twenty twenty one. By the time we rec we could record it. So it was really a, it was a real humdinger. And in that time, I'd, I'd been late, made redundant from the music venue I worked at and I ended up working as a COVID tester. So I was doing all the, all the swabbing. Oh, wow. And, and mate, it was the best job I've ever had. It was so good. Um, the best people there ever. And um, yeah, and that, I mean, that paid for the album because obviously I couldn't go out and spend it. So I ended up blowing it all on the record instead. And um, we we mastered the album in January 2022 with with John Davis at Metropolis, and he did all the Led Zeppelin um, reissues. Wow! And he he did it was real cool. He's, he's such a dude, 
and we're sat in this this beautiful mastering studio and there's a box in front of me and it's got these tapes in it and it goes I'll have a look at that I looked inside it and it was Gorilla's new album so and dude it was just the stories he has is amazing and he's just such a wonderful guy so we mastered it in 20 uh, in January then and then we we sent out to labels and then we started experiencing the hangover that music industry has had from COVID. And label just weren't taking risks on anything. And then nine months later, Fuzz Club come back and said, yeah, we like it, dude. Do you, do you want to come join our family? And Fuzz Club are one of my favourite labels. So for me, it was <clears throat> wet man. dream. Hey, you got a smoker record here on your hands, man. I mean, it is just, it's unreal. I listen to it all day every day for like a week. Um, let me ask you, uh, you're about to start some touring, right? Have you ever come over to the States or no? Not yet. We've, we've had, we've had a few offers before. We've, we've been asked to play South by Southwest three times, but it's so expensive. Yeah. So, but there's, there's some opportunities for us to maybe come to California, which is uh, California and Austin are, are like my wet dreams. So, and um, hopefully, I think we've got some meetings about that in the next month. So the sooner we can come over, man, the better. We'll have to grab a beer. Oh, God, I got to I gotta see you, man. Do you know uh, about when that would be, or is it just talks now? It just talks at the minute. It, it's it's always been broached before, but it, again, it's it's a financial thing. But we've, we've got a, a couple of assets in the States now. Um, and then when you look at uh, the, our... Spotify um, details and stuff. Our our most played country is the states, and I, and I think to be honest, the states is, is is a market I really want to tap into. Plus, I really want to see the states more. I've already been to New York like eighteen years ago, so I need to see more of it. And if I can get my expenses paid, then perfect. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> let's talk about the band. Is it four piece or five piece? It's it's a four piece at the minute. We used to be a five piece with two drummers, and it sounded. I was really really happy with the sound there. But yes, yeah, so it's a four piece now. So there's there's me on guitar and vocals, and then there's um, Liam Yates playing guitar, and Matty Laws on bass, and then there's Sam Matthews on the drums. Uh, so there's a lot of Matthews in the band, and um, they they came up to me uh, before the pandemic started and said, oh if you need any members again, let me know and I'll, I'll come down. And, uh, the poor, <laughs> the poor guys have been sat waiting with me for like four years now waiting to gig. <laughs> yeah, man, we'll, we'll be gigging next month. Don't worry. And four years on, we, <laughs> we played, I think about four shows. Ah. So COVID man, it's, it's. Dirty. Yeah. But other than, let's say, some old psychedelia of like Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett, uh, stuff like that, 60s, did you get into any other kind of psychedelic music? Were you into any, the, like the dead during their heavy experimental era? Or um, I listened to bits and pieces. I'm trying to think now. I mean, I, I got into a lot of the, the, the kind of new wave of psych that happened over the last 10 years when you had people like, like the OCs and Ty Siegel and Goat and yes. um, Night Beats, who were obviously our label mates as well. Um, so I kind of got into that, but the, it's it's a massive mix of, of stuff I've I've kind of learned along the years. And then I, mean, I love stuff like Dr. John. And when you listen to like, you know, Walk on Gilded Splinters, that's voodoo psych, isn't it? It's, it's evil sounding. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I'm trying to think now. I'm on the spot. Um, kind of anything really. I'm quite open to most things. But I, I again with with my dad, I I grew up on a lot of the older stuff. I mean, he, my dad was a mod, um, so he liked all the jam and everything like that. But he also, I mean, my earliest memory really was him playing me Revolver by by the Beatles. And he gets the LP out and he goes, "This band's called the Beatles." And I remember thinking, like three year old, they don't look like Beatles. <laughs> and uh, so and he used to play me that and he, he used to play me like Jimi Hendrix and what have you, he had all the CDs so like I, I was kind of raised on that and then I'd hear stuff that you know like um, Genesis Porridge you know when he did like God Star and whatever, I've heard like, bits like that 
but for me, I I love the real kind of guitar driven stuff and and the stuff where you're working from not a lot to make these kind of soundscapes like like um like the thirteen four elevators. You know, apart from the electric drug, they were just a straight up four piece, weren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so a bit of everything, really. But I am, um, the, the like I said, the the new wave stuff was really, really exciting, and some of the stuff coming out through there was really like eye opening. And you know, the Black Angels. But I think the band to thank for all of that is the Brian Jonestown massacre. Absolutely, absolutely, think, you know, completely. Yeah, I, th- I think. So you go. They just hit you with the, I, I always call it, they're the original heroin rock, you know? <laughs> yeah, completely. It, that's, it just well, comes on with the box and the jangly guitars and the, you know, and, and and just the old, old school sounds. And you're like, oh yeah, I'm on board, you know? But yeah, also sounding man. original, you know? Like your record sounds very original. I hear flavors in there like Morphine and Nick Cave and, and stuff like that, but it's not like oh, I know what this is. It 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 just has a melting pot of just beautiful influences to make your own thing. Well, I th- I think when you when you look at all the kind of all the greatest music in the world now, anyway, they've always kind of won their their influences on their sleeves without without just copying it. But when you think like the Beatles and the Stones took things from the blues and everything, and then. You had like the damned who were taking stuff from the Sonics, and then, um, oh, like well, Twice Oasis, T Rex, and everything. And I think the reason these these bands blow up is because it's it's reminiscent for us, and I think it, familiarity is a real lovely um, comfort mechanism. It's a comfort blanket, isn't it? Yeah. And um, you know that you listen to like you know Anton with with. Um, with the Jonestown, and he's you listen to it. There's bits of Crosby, Stills, and Nash in there, and there's um, I mean, I, I noticed a lot of like Small Faces references, and I, I they're one of my favorite ever bands. And like for me as well, when I started getting into the Jonestown, it was so cool to hear a, a, like an American band, American psych band, referencing the Small Faces because I think they're like one of the kind of more forgotten bands. Of of sixties Britain, aren't they? And um, yeah, I, I think there's there's you get all the 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 Marvin Gaye thing where they they go after anybody who sounds like Marvin Gaye, but we're we're all hearing the same, however many chords there are. Yeah, and of course we're gonna you know it's the same way we've all got accents, isn't it? If we grow up around something, that's what we sound like, and. Um, you know, I thought it was really sweet of Elvis Costello with Olivia Rodrigo. She had that song that sounded like Pump It Up. And he's and he was just like, yeah, that's cool. She listened to me. If she ripped it off, she can have it. That's great. And I think that's a, such a constructive way of, of, of art now, isn't it? Well, even if you look at, like, say, what Sid Barrett and the early uh, Pink Floyd were doing, you know, and then all of a sudden you have Rolling Stones doing 2000 light years, you know, and you're going like, holy shit, these, yeah. guys, you know, like Jagger was always had his ear to the ground, like, hey, what are other people doing? What's hip? What's happening? I want to keep trying different stuff. And and that is a real wild thing to think about, like somebody like Sid Barrett uh, influencing like Mick Jagger. Well, that's it, though, isn't it? I mean, the the sixties community was so small as well, and it's just all about creating music, man. That's that's all we want to do. And instead of instead of getting salty that somebody has taken our or taken inspiration for what we do, just think right on, man. That's sick. Yeah, you know, keep let's let's gig together. Let's go to each other's shows, and that's how we get the scenes as well. You know, the whole New York scene was everyone coming together over music and. Um. Yeah, I, I, people get too precious about it. I think, and you know, like exactly like you said, you know, in the sixties, the Stones and and Sid Barrett and the Small Faces and everything, they're all listening to what each other does. I mean, it's like um, there's there's the kind of contentious thing of um, 
Roxy Lady and Rolling Over by The Small Faces, who recorded it first because it's pretty much the exact same song. Du, 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 du. But it, who gives a shit? They're both great songs. Yeah, yeah. And at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's it, you know, it's very hard in music to do anything where you go, I've never heard this before. You know, I mean, almost, you know, almost, I mean, there was small pockets over the years, say hip hop really exploded the new form and and for sure. And then uh, also stuff like craft work over, you know, way back. Ooh, this is new, but there's nobody that where it comes out and you go, I've never heard this before at all. You're always going to say, I, I, I know where this is coming from. You know, Joshua, again, it's like the accents thing, isn't it? even if you come out, um, you know, doing like a lecture of pop record, someone's always going to go, well, that's that. Or yeah, there's always going to be echoes because really, maybe it's just because we've not found it, but where can we go with music now? I feel like we've covered everything. Yeah. Like in, in 60 years, I think every genre possible has been, has been covered. Um, it was interesting with, with Malcolm who produced the record. Cause he, he um he used to drum for DJ Shadow, and um he actually gave Shadow a few seven inches for introducing, and he was saying like when it comes to hip hop and such, he said you know hip hop sampled R and B, it's sampled rock, but it's not sampled psychedelic music yet. And I thought, yeah, that's interesting, man. And and then I I, I said that to a mate of mine. He said, oh no, as it's this album, which I've forgotten the album, but. I think that's the only way that you can come up with something new now is using things that have already been done and yeah, slam them together. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine like uh, hip hop uh, sampling some like ancient uh, like country music? Also, you know, that'd be wild, man. I'd be yeah. all over that. Just cross pollination of uh, really strange stuff because, of course, you know. Uh, they they grabbing Miles Davis and stuff, and and then of course old R and B and a lot of funk, seventies funk, and you know, uh, I think someone once said that James Brown was the most sampled uh, man in the world, which I probably believe, you know. Yeah. But to do something like yeah, psych psychedelic yeah. hip hop over it would that would be really interesting, and it might be out there, and I just haven't heard it yet, like. That's the thing also with music. You guys have been around. I'm hardcore into new music, always looking for it. And you guys have been around for years and I hadn't even heard of you. So I'm always digging. So you never know what's out there. That's it. You've you've always just got to keep looking out. You know, you've, you've never completed it. And I, I, I feel sad for people who are just like interested in new music anymore. I've found the bands I like. Because, you know, if, if, like for me, I could have quite happily sat and listened to the Black Angels for the rest of my life. But then there's bands coming out now like Viagra Boys and um, Warm Boucher and stuff who were just so fucking cool, man. And why would you want to, like, give up hearing all these new bands? Yeah. Well, they, they definitely, you and myself being artists, uh, they inspire us. Also, that's crazy because I think that people stop getting uh, creative when they're stuck in a box of I listen to these 10 bands and I listen to I watch these 20 movies every year. Look, I'm, yeah, I'm my- the movies like every year I watch Jaws and Godfather and Apocalypse Now and Chinatown and Deer <laughs> Hunt. But oh, oh man, what a yeah. thing. But when it comes to music, man, I'm all it's almost like a buzz for me, man, like a rush. And it, it goes back to that junior high in the playground with the Walkman of like, dude, you got to hear this, this fucking, you know, this Prince sign of the times record, you know, or whatever. <laughs> You're just turning people on to stuff and you hope that they take it in. But I would say you're right. Like, I would say about 70% of the people are like, yeah, I'll check it out. And they don't, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the amount of people I was sending, I'll be, you need to listen to this, man. And then it just, they don't yeah. listen to it. And it's, um, I, I mean, 
if you keep getting the same albums people all the time, then you're going to be like, oh fucking, I'll listen to it later. But yeah, it's and me, me and my me and my friend, um, we we make a really big thing of like sending each other records all the time and albums. Like, mate, you've got to listen to this, and then the other mate, Karma as well. He's we had a big thing. We've been planning it for about three years now to have a record night. So we bring ten or twelve records to each other's houses, and we listen to every record over a few drinks. Three years later, still not done it. But it, that's life, isn't it? But yeah. it, it's that thing of when you sit with somebody, you go, "Dude, you need to hear this. This is the best thing ever." Mate, this is it's it's such a like a, a tight bond you have with people as well by doing them things. I think. Yeah, yeah um, it's a trust thing too. It's a, it's. A, I got a few buddies like that. I think as you get older, you get these buddies that are way into music still. Mine being Greg Dooley from the Afghan Wigs, and then Jay from Rivals. Nice. And whenever we're around each other, it's like, man, you heard this? Have you heard this? Hey, yeah. I've heard this, and it's wild because he'll have stuff I have no idea, and I have stuff he has no idea, and we're both into music. It's like, man, I've never heard this, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, that's it. And it's such an intensely personal thing as well, isn't it, music? So you kind of bury yourself like that. It's it's a real nice thing. And I think it's it's a really big compliment to have somebody send you a band because that's them going, I really like this and I want you to like it. Yeah. And it's yeah. it's a, it's a, I think it's a really sweet thing, really. Yeah. And, and I, I think, and again, kind of going back to the whole algorithm thing and, and the tension span and everything, like, I don't think people have that same. People do, but I think for the, the by and large, a lot of people now they, they don't have that same passion for it. It's like, oh my god, this is so special! I've got to show it to somebody. And then you, but then you on the other end of the spectrum, you get the hipster assholes who who don't want anyone to hear that music. Oh yeah, it's their own secret band, and it's like, oh, get fucked, man! I like, love that those band guys. Is, yeah, man, they're the worst. Because, like, them keeping that band a secret, the band can't afford to keep going if they're already being played by the same 10 people. This you is know? our band. That started back yeah. in punk rock, you know, like 70s punk rock. Like the clan yeah, band, you know? And then, and, yeah. And then, like, Strummer was like, fuck you, yeah, this band's for the people, not just a certain amount of people. <laughs> it's- yeah, that's it, man. And that, this is where, like, the Black, the Black Keys, I love, because, like, didn't want to put all these songs in adverts at first, did they? Because, like, oh, no, people will think we sold out. And then they did, and they got massive. And people going, oh, the sellouts. Get stretched. Like, these guys are making money, and they're still making great albums. Yeah. Like, why would you be salty about the band doing well? Yeah. Like, and, and, you know, but then you look at bands like Queens of the Stone Age as well. I mean, they've always been, like, quite a big band, but they really sent it, and they've gone, like, astronomic now. And, um... Man, I just feel happy for him. Oh God! And, uh, oh God! Yeah, you know why I'm happy is that means there's a shitload of people out there that are into some music that's not your radio fucking force fed bullshit. So I'm like, totally, man. hey man, if five million people love Josh Homme, that's a good thing because. It, you know, it's like in the movie world, when a good movie comes out that's not a superhero film, you're like, God, please make some more of those like they used to do. Totally, man. This is it. And I've got to say, with Homie as well, he's such a rock star. Like, I, I saw them in Finsbury Park in London years ago, and um, they had Iggy Pop and the Hive supporting and Run the Jewels. So it was insane. But when Queens of Stone Age on stage, they look like they could kick the shit out of everybody in that audience in one go. Yeah. And you look at him and he's like, you know he's a sweet guy, but he's also terrifying. And I, I, I'm gutted. We we all tried to get tickets to see them in Halifax in June, but it, it sold out like that, so we've all missed out. But they really are one of the, the greatest dangerous rock and roll bands out there now. And and then, you know, you still meet all these like purists Queens fans were like, uh, no, they sold out when they did the way you used to. Fuck off, man. Yeah. It's yeah. it's a great so it's a great album. Again, Queens have not done a bad album. No, man. It's uh well, Josh is uh to me is the high watermark of art. I always think about things I do and I'm like, well, would Josh do this? And I'm 
you know, in a way of like, he's a good, he's a good captain of the ship. He, he, mm. does, he doesn't do any bullshit. He tells you how it is. People get angry and he's like, ah, yeah. You think my records would be good if I was a normal person? Fuck you. Yeah. you know? yeah, this it, is the it. danger you like, and this is it. Sometimes the tiger bites, man. You know, Siegfried and Roy. Sometimes you. Sometimes the circus gets out of control. That's it, and, and that's the where Homie is is amazing with it. He just lets things just send. He just lets it go, and he's he's got such a unique way of playing guitar as well that. Even if you learn all the little scales that he does, you're still not Josh Homme. Yeah, yeah. You know, you you meet him ten a penny. All these people who want to be Homme, but you'll never be Josh Homme. No, no, yeah, never. I'd love to be, but there's there's no way. I'm not tall enough for a start. But yeah, are you, what are you? Uh, are you a comedy fan? I love comedy. Yeah, yeah man. So I've, I've obviously watched a lot of your things. Yeah, oh, that's uh, right. and I've, and I'm a big fan of Bill Bear as well and Ricky Gervais. And um, there's a new guy in, in, in England called Paul Smith. I don't know if you've found, found him on the algorithm. No. He's a, he's a scouser and he's fucking hilarious, man. He's really good. Yeah, definitely worth checking him out. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, he's like the most like straight down the middle British name ever, Paul Smith. But really, really good, man. Listen, man, it was great talking to you, Matt. And uh, once again, I absolutely love this record. It's called The Recovery Effects. It's out right now. They got a great video, Fourth Pass Over the Graveyard, that is just fantastic. And I don't know if you have any other videos out, but uh, go to YouTube. Also hit their website. Follow them on Instagram. Give them your Instagram because it's not, it's like BD movement, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, BDM official. Okay. And then... And then uh, and you're going to be playing. You can go on our website. Europe. Yeah, so we've we've um we've got two show, launch shows on the third of May. We're playing in London at the One Hundred Club. Um, we've got Tag and Kawabe from Boningen, who, if you've not checked them out, oh, unbelievable band. And there's Oliver Marson um and opening the show up. And then we've got the the new Adelphi Club in Hull on Friday the fifth of May, which is also my mother's birthday, so I better get a good present for her. Um, and we've got the fruit and the big river boys supporting there. And the Adelphi is like a legendary venue. It's like the number one jewel in Hull's crown. So it's really nice to kind of launch the, the album at these two real legendary venues. And then we're going to be touring later in the year. We're just getting them all booked now. Well, I hope to see you in California. Please, uh, email me and hit me right away. When you find out when it is, I'll start promoting it for you. And I'll come down and uh, hang out. I, I can't wait to see this record live. And I can't wait to meet you, man. Thanks for doing the show. Buddy. Yeah, man. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, dude. Oh, God, yeah. Fun. Yeah, and uh, we'll talk soon, man. It's time for me to go to back to bed. I was I was uh, at <laughs> shows last night. I'm like, oh, I got to oh, go to 30. <laughs> I'm sorry for dragging you out of bed, man. I'd have stayed up later. <laughs> oh, it's all good, man. It's all good. And uh, everybody listen to the podcast, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dean Del Rey, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And please leave a review. I'm going to ask you guys to do that because it always helps the uh, the algorithm. But uh, thanks a lot, man. Uh, thanks, Juan. Well, cheers, Delta, Dean. Black Delta movement right there, Matt Burr. Thank you so much, buddy. Take care, dude. I'll see ya. Right, see you later.